often we'd uh, introduce some rather abstract uh, objects. And today I want to try and get some very computational and concrete methods for getting at these things in very explicit ways. So um, first of all, I want to review some of the uh, very nice constructions that I first learned from Cass and uh, Wickelgren, Wickelgren about um, Euler classes and uh, local indices. There are explicit formulas for these Euler classes. So you remember um, we had a vector bundle on some, say, smooth scheme X, and with a zero section as zero. Then we have the uh, Tom class, and, and we have some cohomology theory E. Let's work over field K, and we have some Tom class in uh, theory. The Tom space. So R here is the rank. And um, of course, the, the, Tom, the Tom space is just V modulo V minus the zero section. So this is really the same thing as the cohomology with supports along the zero section on V. And I forgot there's some kind of, depending on the type of theory, there's some kind of orientation information. If the theory is oriented, then this funny squiggle isn't there. So the squiggle is equal to the empty set in the oriented case. It could be the inverse of the determinant of V in the SL oriented case, and it could be minus V in the general case. So um, that's the, the Tom class that lives there, and the Euler class is just the pullback by the zero section of the Tom class. Okay, and this lives in the uh, theory on X again with whatever the orientation is. Okay, now suppose instead of this section S zero, we have just some arbitrary section S. Well, then we get the same thing. You can always do a A1 homotopy between S zero and S by just multiplying S by T and letting T go to zero. So that says this is also, the Euler class is also equal to the pullback of the Tom class in here. But see, when you pull back the Tom class, it pulls also pulls the supports back. So if you let Z be S inverse of the zero section, then you actually get a um, sort of a Euler class with supports on Z. And, but this, this will depend on the section S, because if you move the section S, it'll move the zero locus Z. So you can't expect that to be independent, but in any case, so we put it in the notation. And this lives in the, um, cohomology on X with what other orientation with supports on Z. Okay, so let's, uh, we'll be interested in the special case where, um, yeah, the rank of the bundle is equal to the dimension of X. So let's just call that D. And in that case, a general section would have only zero dimensional uh, zero locus. So let's assume that, let's assume that the dimension of Z is zero, but we won't assume that the intersection, the, the pullback of the zero section uh, is transverse. Uh, so let's just say that Z is some finite set of points and there might be some kind of multiplicities along these points. And the these Euler class with support is kind of telling you about what the multiplicities are. So since it breaks up into pieces, this, this, this guy here, this um, cohomology with supports also breaks up into pieces. So it says this uh, Euler class with supports on Z is just a sum of pieces, Euler class with supports on each of the uh, Zi's. Okay, and so for simplicity, we can just, let's just assume, we can localize around each of these points so let's just assume Z is Z, a single point, just for the purpose of discussion. And we want a formula for this local Euler class. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> well, the first case, 
let me say, uh, I won't say too much about this, but the first case is when E is just uh, motivic cohomology, um, then this 2DD part, so D is equal to R, so 2DD part is just the child group of co-dimension D cycles on X, which is just the zero cycles, because X has dimension D. And then if you put the supports condition in, you have a purity theorem say on Z. This is just child zero of the point Z, which is just the integers times Z. And what you're getting, then this local Euler class is just equal to the, um, some multiple of Z. And what multiple is it is just equal to the intersection multiplicity of the section S of X with the zero section at the point Z times the single point Z. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, classical case. Let's um, do something a little more complicated. Second case is we take um, E to be K theory. So this is the spectrum representing usual K theory. And then the um, E2D, we have a Bach periodicity, the 2DD doesn't do anything. This is just K naught of X. If we look at it with supports, well, I'm gonna do something a little uh, perhaps unsuspected here. It's K naught of X is really K naught of perfect complexes on X. And K naught with supports is K naught of perfect complexes on X whose cohomology is supported at Z. And um, on the other hand, then you have some kind of uh, resolution theorem, which tells you that this is the same thing as K naught of the category of modules over the local ring of finite length. Right? In other words, supported at uh, Z. Okay, and then you have a davies Hodge theorem, which says, well, if I have a module with finite length, I can find the filtration. So this is, this is like the resolution theorem. And I have the davies Hodge theorem, which says this is the same thing as K naught of just the residue field, KZ, K naught of Z. And of course, this is just the integers by rank times the class of the residue field. All right, so the reason I went through this is uh, we wanna calculate what is this E, Z, V, S? Well, remember this is, I take S star of the Tom class of V, where I'm taking the Tom class in K theory. And remember how we got the Tom class in K theory? The Tom class in K theory is the Kazool complex. So I have this Kazool complex for the vector bundle V with respect to its canonical section. And uh, so what is that? That's, um, if you call, that's a P star V dual going to OV by the canonical section, what's called T dual. The, val the zeros of this is just the zero section. So that's the structure sheet of the zero section. And then you have the wedge two of that, et cetera, all the way up to the top wedge. Okay, so when you take S star of that, well, now the point is that um, let's say we're working near, we work near Z, and let's take a uh, local basis for, for V, so basis of sections E1 up to ED, and then we can write our section S as some SI EI. And the fact that the zero locus is just concentrated at Z means that the, this set of elements, S1 up to SD, a sequence of elements is a, a regular sequence in the local ring OX at Z. 
And when you have a regular sequence, the Kazool complex for that regular sequence uh, remains exact. And that's what happens when you pull this back. So when you take S star of the Kazool complex or V canonical and use this basis, this is just the Kazool complex for OZ, OX, Z uh, to the D with respect to these elements S1 up to SD. So that's what you get. It's the same thing as what I wrote here, except it becomes a little more concrete. It's just that you have OX, let me just call OXO, just O to the D going to O, to O mod the sections. Let me call that thing O bar. And this is just the map, you know, where the basis element EI goes to SI. And then you have the various exterior powers of it, all the way up to the top exterior power. And so that remains exact. Okay, but since it's exact, so here we're over here now. Where it's a perfect complex with cohomology supported at Z. But since this is uh, this is a resolution of O bar that says by the resolution theorem, we're really getting just a class of O bar in uh, K naught of modules of finite length over the local ring. And then let's, uh, the Davisage would say, well, I have something of finite length and then I take um, a filtration so that the relative pieces are actually vector spaces over the residue field. But to make it a little easier, let's just assume that the residue field is contained in the local ring, that's not really much of a restriction because if I want to make the computation, I can always uh, increase the base field to do that necessary or pass to a completion. In any case, when you do that, when you apply de visage, what are you getting? Then you're getting just the, uh, well, on one hand, you're getting the length of O bar as an O module, that's the multiplicity times the class of the residue field. And this is just equal to the dimension of O bar over the residue field as a subfield times the class of KZ. Okay, so I'm sure you all know all about this. It's just going over in some gory detail. So this is the, this, that's the formula for the local Euler class in that case. Now what I'm really interested in is uh, the case of um, the Hermitian K theory. So there, again, we had the, uh, remember the Tom class of V was the same Kazool complex together with the quadratic form. And the quadratic form was, um, I took the term in degree I, so I think of this as P star V shifted by i, it's in homological degree i, and then gets paired with the term in degree d minus i, or v dual, sorry, v dual degree d minus i, then the, just the wedge product goes into the determinant, the top wedge will be determinant of the pullback of the dual, so that's just the pullback of the inverse of the determinant of v, but in degree d. So induces the map of this Q, which you think of just the Kazool complex, tensor itself, into this determinant of V shifted by D. Okay, so that's the that's the Kazool complex with its quadratic form, and then this local gadget here is just S star of this pair. Zool and Q. And where does this live? Well, this is supposed to live, let me just write the formula, it's supposed to live in K naught two D with supports on Z on X. So what is this? Well, these are um, quadratic forms. So let me call that GW, Grotendieck Witt, of the perfect complexes 
whose cohomology are supported on Z, let's say over the local ring O, but the values are not uh, in O or in K or whatever, they're in uh, this element, this complex determinant inverse of B, V shifted by D. So that's where you end. It's, so this is the analog of K naught. Instead of K naught, you have GW of the same kind of object. And the value of the quadratic form is this inverse determinant in degree, homological degree D. So All right. Mark, so, yes. Mark, there's, a, there's a question for you. Ah. You look at the q and I can't see the answer. Yes, that's right. How's that? Is that better? You'll be able to see it for a while. OK. So that's the. That's where it's living. And then we have the resolution theorem, which tells you that this is the same thing as GW of modules of finite length over O um, with values in the inverse determinant. Now, I, what I'm not telling you here is to get the GW, to get the Grotendieck bit, you have to say what the duality is. And here there's a little technical point that the duality is given by x. So we're not going to talk about that in any detail. So let me just hide that under the rug. And then you have the de visage part, which tells you that this is the same thing as GW of the residue field with coefficients in the determinant inverse of V, but the fact that this X group, remember in a sort of local Grotendieck duality, the X group corresponds in some sense to the um, top wedge of the ideal sheaf defining Z. So you have to tensor with that. So the maximal ideal of my local ring modulo its square. That turns out to be where it lives. So there's a sort of purity twisting going on here. So this goes to something. So we have a bunch of rather complicated gadgets and this goes to something in here. This is a fairly explicit gadget. I mean, these are just quadratic forms on KZ vector spaces with values in this line. This is, this is, a, this is a particular one dimensional KZ vector space just to make things canonical. And uh, we should be able to write down a formula. So there is a formula for this. This is the formula. Just do uh, task Picklegren. Really building on some work from the 70s from Shea and Short. So that's what I want to tell you about. Okay, so we're trying to try and compute this thing. Okay, so I'm not going to show you how you go from here to here. I'm just going to show you what the answer is. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this up here. And so remember we had V, what do we have? We have V and we made a choice of a basis. This is our local basis. And we had our section S, which in terms of this local basis, we can write as SI EI. Okay, and then we also have our local ring O which contains this maximal ideal, and we'll make another choice. We'll choose some generators for the maximal ideal. We're talking about a smooth uh, variety X over K, it's really over KZ. And uh, we'll choose, we'll choose uh, parameters, T1 up to TD. Okay, so now, of course, the fact that the S, that Z is the zero locus of S, just says that all the SIs are in M. So it says you can write SI as a sum, AIJ, TJ. So these AIJs, that's essentially the partial derivatives of S with respect to the Ts. That's all that is. All right. And then, um, great. So now we have this element, epsilon, which is just the determinant of this matrix, but I'm gonna view it in O bar. Remember O bar was O modulo the S's. And 
it's not unreasonable. The AIJs are not going to be the ideal generated by the S's unless something funny happens. In fact, it's not because we divided by the T's. All right, so we've got that. And um, now what do we do with that? We choose, so there's a choice here, a KZ linear map. Trace from O bar back to KZ, which is normalized by saying that this trace of this epsilon is one. It'll turn out that the eventual, uh, the class of the quadratic form we get will not depend on the choice of this trace. Okay, so um, once we've done that, what do we do? Then we have a uh, bilinear form. KZ, the shea storch bilinear form where XY is just equal to the trace of x times y. And we have the quadratic form, q of x is just the trace of x squared, just the, what you get from the bilinear form. Okay, so we made some choices. We made choices of the e's and the t's. And this is a quadratic form in kz. So now I wanna get a quadratic form, not in kz, but in this funny line, and that will get rid of the choices. So I just, so the class of this, the answer is the class of this local Euler characteristic is exactly this quadratic form multiplied by, well, it should be in the inverse of the determinant. So I take E1 wedge up to ED, or maybe it's ED up to E1. I think there's a sign issue here. So that generates the determinant, so it's inverse, or if you like, the wedge of the dual basis generates the um, inverse of the determinant. And similarly, if you take the images of the ti's, they're in m, you look at them in m mod m squared, and take this, then this lives in kz tensor, the uh, inverse. Well, it has values, it's a map, it's a quadratic form mapping O bar to AZ tensor the inverse determinant of V tensor the inverse determinant of M mod M squared. And you, it's not hard to check that that's independent of the choices. And that's the answer. So that's a very nice uh, result of uh, Cass and Nickelgren. So let me just uh, make this even more concrete Let's just take uh, d equal to one and uh, forget the bases, just get the, the form. So let's say s is just a unit times t to the n. So then O bar has basis one t to t to the n minus one, call that v one up to v n. And then, uh, okay, we write s, it's u times t, u is a unit. This is u times t minus to the n minus one times t. So this is our a, it's a one one if you like. And then, so the epsilon is just equal to um, u t to the n minus one bar in O bar. In other words, modulo, which is just O modulo t to the n. All right, and now if we take, um, we can take the trace, we make our choice of our trace by just saying trace of vi is equal to zero if i is not equal to n. And let's see, it should send this, this epsilon is of course just u times uh, vn. So it should be one over u if i equals n. Okay, and now we can just write down what our form is, um, the, the bilinear form. Let's let's do that. Then we get a matrix. This thing of x y is just equal to the trace of x y, and the matrix in our basis is just one over u, and then this sort of anti-diagonal matrix. 
Okay, now of course in quadratic form land, one over u is up to a square, uh, it's up to a square is the same as u. So this is isomorphic. If you think about it, if you have, you can pair the one with the one and the other one with the other one, et cetera. So you think about it um, a minute. If um, n is even, this is just n over two copies of the hyperbolic form just by pairing the corresponding uh, off diagonal elements. And if n is odd, you have the middle element, which gives you a one over u, which we'll call a u just for simplicity of notation. And then you have, oh, sorry, the minus. Then you have the remaining off diagonal elements, which contribute a hyperbolic form. And there's an even a nicer way to write this. This is just the one dimensional form u. This is the form x goes to u x squared. That's the notation times this form n epsilon. So this is the number n viewed as a quadratic form. And what does I mean by that? I mean n epsilon is the sum of ones, but it's the sum of minus ones. Minus one to the i, i equals one to n minus one. So um, because the hyperbolic form is a one plus a minus one, you can see that this gives you exactly the same answer. And now if we take a general d, but assume so another case, let's assume that our S is a sum ui t to the ni times ei. Then, um, well, I mean, you can see what the computation is. This quadratic form qs will just be uh, the product, the one dimensional form product of the uis times the product of the ni's sub epsilon. That's an easy computation. It follows from this. And finally, the, the other simple case if it, is if S is just um, sort of the non-degenerate case. It's just gotten by a scalar matrix. So here, the, let's assume that the AIJ is um, symmetric and non-degenerate. Then uh, this Shayish storage form is just equal to the determinant. Okay, so and you can, I mean, in principle, you, if you have the, the section explicitly, you can find the form explicitly. So it's, it's nice and explicit. All right, so um, let's see. It's time for some further applications. So I want to see how this uh, works in a geometric situation. And this is what we call a Riemann Hurwitz formula. Which um, is also can be viewed as a calculation of Euler characteristics using Morse theory. All right, so um, let me just mention the theorem. Suppose we have um, field K, X smooth projective over K, C of some dimension D, C smooth projective curve over K, everything, let's say irreducible, and uh, F from X to C, um, just some surjective morphism. Okay, and let's suppose, um, so this will have critical points. In other words, uh, a general point of C, let's assume that uh, surjective and separable. So it means that a general point of C, the inverse image, the fiber over C will be smooth. And then there'll be some places where the fiber is not smooth. Let's assume that um, F has uh, isolated, in other words, finitely many critical points. So the critical points, in other words, are just where the differential is zero. So let's say those are points um, X1 to Xn. And a technical assumption, we, we don't really need this, but uh, just to make the formula simpler, let's assume that the field extensions are all separable. So for example, if K were a perfect field, that would not be 
in it. So then we have a formula for this quadratic Euler characteristic minus one to the dimension of x times the Euler characteristic in the quadratic sense. Remember, this lives in GW of k. Give the following. So you have the sum over the critical points of what? Well, you have these. Um, ah, I forgot an assumption. We assume further, assume also, sorry. We have an isomorphism rho of the um, dualizing sheaf, or just the one forms on C, isomorphic to the square of some line bundle. Sorry, that's an important assumption. I forgot to put that in. Okay, so then when you do that, this D, notice that um, DF is a section of, not to, it's not a section of omega. On X, it's a section of omega tensor F star of omega of C inverse. So this is where the Euler classes would normally live, but we're going to put them inside of this guy here by a row tensor L to the minus two or F star of L to the minus two. So I've kind of run out of room with my explanations. So remember, we're thinking of DF as living in this vector, a section of this vector bundle. And so if we do that, we get the sum i equals one to n of the, we take the trace of this quadratic form from kx down to k of the local Euler class for this df living in omega x tensor f star l to minus two. So that's the, that's the contribution for the critical points. And then we have sort of the general fiber also contributes something. So minus the degree over K, but now this is all numerical information. We take the usual first term class of my L, pull back, and then times, these are the usual first, usual term classes. So in the chow, chow ring, if you like, of omega x over k times the pullback of the first term class of the omega c over k to the i minus one, this number times the hyperbolic form. Sorry for the formula getting a little messy. So, so why is this, um, so that's the formula. So this is, uh, if you take the rank, so the rank, applying the rank gives you the classical riemann hurwitz formula. And if you assume that K sits inside of R and you take the associated signature, this is just Morse theory. This gives you the Morse theory uh, computation for um, the Euler characteristic of the real points. But this is sort of a quadratic lifting of both of those computations. Okay, and let me make um, perhaps one little remark from this formula. Um, let's suppose that the dimension, the dimension of X is odd. Well, everything is hyperbolic here. This part is already hyperbolic, but we already know that a um, Euler characteristic of a uh, smooth projective odd dimensional variety over K is hyperbolic. So that gives you a relation. It says there's this funny relation on the, on this term, it says that the sum of these traces of these local, let me just shorten this here, is also hyperbolic. So um, I think it's, I don't know what to do with it, but I think it's an amusing and um, 
perhaps surprising relation. I mean, if you make, you can even make this quite specific, uh, if you made a little exercise for yourself, is to take the case where X is just a hyperbolic curve mapping to P1, ramified at some um, set of points, say 2G plus 2, uh, uh, say a sub -clo reduced closed subscheme of P1 of degree 2G plus 2 over the base field by taking the square root of the defining equation. And then you get a funny relation on the um, corresponding differential. So if you take that case, it says if you take P2G plus 2 in a x, so degree of this, that degree, with, um, which is a separable polynomial, so all the roots are different in the algebraic closure, then if you take um, x tilde to be the zero sub scheme, then you have a trace map from uh, the Grotendieck Wittring. This will be, let's assume that this is, uh, their base field again is uh, separable. So this is a, well, a separable polynomial, so it's a separable extension. You have the total quotient field, this might be several pieces. And then it, the, it says that if you take the trace, this trace map, apply to the one dimensional quadratic form two over the derivative of p evaluated it here this is hyperbolic probably easy to tell but it's just a special case of this formula which then generalizes a higher dimension okay so i want to turn to um so that's a little bit about euler classes I want to turn to um, Euler characteristics for computation okay so I'm going to remember recall this theorem um, with Raxit that says if we have x over k smooth projective, then this Euler characteristic has an explicit form. It's equal to this um, sum of the HP x omega q's, shifted by q minus p, together with this um, cup product form composed with the trace map, so x dimension d, so this will go from h d x omega k All right, um, so the thing is, this is um, mostly hyperbolic. So we already know that if the dimension is, um, odd, then everything is hyperbolic, but you can see that because if um, the dimension is odd, then you're always pairing an HPQ with an HD minus P, D minus Q, and those are never the same group. So you're always pairing one group with its dual, and that's automatically hyperbolic. And so if you throw away those parts, you see the only thing this is, this is equal to some hyperbolic part plus the form just in the middle dimension. So let's assume that D is equal to 2M. Then this is just equal to the top product form on H M X omega M into K, which is just saying X goes to the trace of X squared. Okay, so that's a very explicit, just one piece. Now, since you have such an explicit form, what you can do with this is this, this enables um, sort of uh, twisting constructions. So let me just say a word about this. Let's just take the case. Just, sorry, Mark, just real quick. Uh, Kirsten says that you have too many M's in your formulas. Maybe. Oh. 
<laughs> Too many M's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. A. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kirsten. So this, uh, too many M's, yes, thank you, I see that now. So this enables twisting. So let's just take D equals two, first non-trivial case. And then we're just looking at a quadratic form on H1, X omega X, going by this um, decay, X goes to trace of X squared. Now, if we, we're working over a field K, but if we go up to K bar, we know that H1 X K bar is just the base extension here. And we have the same form, right? We have the exact same form here. And so the, the H1X sits inside here as a K subspace. So explicitly what it says is you can take the form, so for Q, you can take this, let me just call this form Q. You can take Q for X over K bar and then restrict it to this guy here. This will land in K and this is just equal to your original form Q. So now usually what happens is you might have a natural basis for the thing over the algebraic closure where you can easily compute the form. And then you just have to see, I have to find now a K basis of this K subspace. And that will tell me how to compute my original Q. So for example, one way you do this, so example, if uh, PG of X is equal to zero, then this H1 X K bar, or even over K, is just equal to k bar times, let's say, and the q is equal to zero. Q is a different q, so I'll say h, h1 of x o x equals zero. Then this thing is just k times the, the car group of x over k bar, and you the this form here, q x k bar, is just equal to the intersection form on pick extended k bar, whoops, extended k bar linearly. So that's often something you can compute explicitly. And then you have this uh, question of fin finding this k vector space in here and making a basis. So that's the, that's the twisting construction. And I just want to remark is you can't do that in the grotendieck vid ring. The grotendieck vid ring doesn't have descent. But if you have an explicit form, then you can uh, do this twisting construction. Okay, so I, I won't, I'm running out of time, let me not do an example of that. But instead, let me turn to another explicit case. Explicit case of hypersurfaces. So uh, one simple case is a diagonal hypersurfaces. So in other words, generalized Fermat hypersurfaces. So that's, you have a hypersurface given by a sum of look like this, Ti to some power E. So this is sitting inside of projective space of dimension N plus one. So this is a hypersurface of uh, degree E dimension n. And let's assume n is even. All right, so um, in that case, the Riemann, let me just tell you what the answer is, the riemann hurwitz formula, you can apply it to the following thing. You can take uh, the map, you have a rational map of x to p1, which is just sending x0 to xn plus one to the last Two coordinates. Of course, that's not defined when the last two coordinates is zero. That defines a hypersurface Z. It's a uh, co-dimension one subvariety of X, Z, which is just another diagonal hypersurface in a projective space of um, smaller dimension. 
So if you blow this up, then you have a morphism here, F. You can apply the riemann hurwitz formula to this guy plus uh, induction for the Z plus uh, a blow up formula. You have a formula for the blow up. Let me, the interest of time, let me just say that or the Euler characteristic. And that leads to the following formula that um, in this diagonal case, the Euler characteristic um, is quite simple. It's the one dimensional form E plus some multiple depending only on N and E of the hyperbolic form. This is again, if E is, now if E is odd, the odd degree case is simpler. And the even case, you have an extra term times, again, the product of the AI plus a multiple of the hyperbolic form. This is for E even. So for example, if, if E is two, if you have a quadric, then uh, this, so in other words, then you're just taking a quadratic form. Every quadratic form can be uh, T, can be diagonalized. So this is some quadratic form Q and this product of the AIs is just the discriminant of Q. And so you get the, um, right, the Euler characteristic of the quadric X is just equal to two uh, plus minus two times the discriminant and then plus, I guess, um, N over two times the hyperbolic form. So quite explicit and you get this, well, maybe a little disappointing. You just get this rather elementary invariant of the quadric in the Euler characteristic. All right, so um, that's nice, but not every hypersurface is uh, diagonal. So what can you do for a general hypersurface? Well, there's, there's a way to do that also. Let's uh, take the general hypersurface. So you, let's take X inside of T n plus one over K, uh, smooth and defined by some degree E polynomial. That's a question mark. Ah, what is A and E? It's a number. So A and E, yeah, thanks. A and E is a number. Um, I mean, you can write down what it is. It's um, the number that it is. Let me put it this way. You can find, it's not hard to find a formula for the Euler the topological Euler characteristic of a hypersurface of degree E in T n plus one. Let's say you know that, then the rank of this quadratic Euler characteristic is that number. On the other hand, the rank of the H is two. So you have that equation to solve. In other words, the, um, this A n E in the odd case is the topological Euler characteristic of X minus one then divided by two. And in the even case, it's the topological Euler characteristic minus two divided by two. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so um, back to the general case. Uh, let's say we take our um, hypersurface defined by um, a degree E polynomial and we assume it's smooth. And let's assume that E is prime to the characteristic of K. Then we have the Jacobian ring. So this is a Jacobian ring. Um, this is defined by taking, modding out by the partial derivatives of F. And under this assumption that E is prime to the characteristic, the Euler formula tells you that the original F is in this idea. And what that means is, of course, F being smooth means that F together with all of its partial derivative have no zeros 
in the projective space, which means if you look in the affine space, this thing here has zero locus. Um, this ideal has zero locus, just zero in the affine space, which means that the Jacobian ring is a finite dimensional K algebra. And more, moreover, you have n plus two variables and you have n plus two equations. It's also a complete intersection ID, complete intersection. Okay, so this, uh, the general theory of such rings tells you that it has a one dimensional socle. In other words, you look at palm of K, which is, in other words, you take K modulo the uh, variables mapping into this ring. There's a one dimensional uh, image of that. And so it has a socle, one dimensional. And it's generated by this shear storch element. So in other words, you write the partial of fi with respect to the partial of f with respect to ti, you write it as a sum of aij times tj, and you let epsilon be the determinant of this aij. The bar, so this is in JF, then the socle is equal to K times epsilon. So we have a quadratic form. We have the Shea Storch quadratic form from JF, or let's say, and do I want the quadratic? Yeah, let's take the quadratic form or the pairing. Maybe I just write down the pairing, probably better. Okay, so um, let's see, I need the trace form, but I'll say what that is in a second. You have to choose a trace form. I choose the trace form since JF is graded. See, these are all, all these partial derivatives are all degree E minus one. So JF is a graded ring. So I define it this way. I take X, Y, J. And if um, these are homogeneous, then this is equal to zero. Ah, so what's the, I see, what's the degree of this thing? This is in degree, you count, let's see. The derivatives have degree E minus one. That means these coefficients have degree E minus two and there are N plus two of them. So this is in degree E minus two times N plus two. And so for homogeneous elements X and Y, the pairing will be zero if degree of X plus degree of one is not equal to this magic number. And it's equal to lambda if x times y is equal to lambda times epsilon. In other words, the trace form is just the one which sets epsilon to zero and all the other graded components in JF to zero. Okay, so what does this have to do with anything? Well, on the other hand, we have this really beautiful theorem of Clemens and Griffiths arising from Griffiths study of rational integrals back in the 70s, which says that there's an isomorphism from um, HQ X omega P isomorphic to the certain graded piece in this Jacobian ring, and it's in this degree, Q plus one times E minus N minus two. So this is a generalization of the classical theorem on residues, which tells you that the, um, you look at the case, um, of, sorry, this is not quite right. I have to put a little prim here. And this is for P plus Q equals the dimension N. So I'll tell you what the prim means in a minute. It usually doesn't mean anything, but um, <clears throat> yes. So um, if Q is zero and P is N, this is just H zero. This is just the um, canonical. Uh, this is just the global sections of the canonical sheaf. And we know what the canonical sheaf is by the adjunction formula. So this is just the generalization of that to all the cohomology. So, and what's the primitive guy? HQ X omega P primitive is equal to um, zero if P plus Q 
is not equal to n, it's equal to the h, the whole thing, if p plus q equals n, and p is not equal to q, in other words, they're both different from this half. And what is it in the interesting case? Well, if p equals q equals half the dimension, so this is m, which is n over two, then we have the class of a linear section. So this X is in a, is a hypersurface in a projective space, and we have the class of a linear section of a dimension, let's see, equal, yeah, of co-dimension N over two. This lives in H M X omega M. And we have our quadratic form, the cup product followed by the trace map. So this is equal to the perpendicular. With respect to L. Okay, so you're losing exactly one class. It turns out that the P plus Q is not equal to N. Everything in the cohomology of X in degrees different from N comes from the projective space. So it's not so interesting. All right, so that's the Clement Griffiths theorem. And now we have two things. We have, let's see, we have, of course, and this is perpendicular with respect to the um, intersection form, which defines our quadratic Euler characteristic. Then um, this JF is telling us, should be telling us something about the remaining part of the um, quadratic Euler characteristic, right? We know what the quadratic Euler characteristic is, sorry. We know what this Q on L is. It's just equal to the degree of L squared, which is equal to my E. So we know what that part is. And this is telling us what the, the remaining part where P plus Q is not equal to N. This just contributes a hyperbolic part in the, Euler, in the quadratic Euler characteristic. So we might expect that this um, quadratic form here, this Shea-Storch quadratic form on um, these this part of the Jacobian ring tells you exactly the Euler characteristic, and that's almost right. So what the theorem is is essentially due to Clemens Griffiths, although it's not quite, but more or less, is that the um, Shea-Storch form on this. Um, direct sum over Q of this J F Q plus one, or is it Q plus one times E minus N minus two is equal to, well, let's see, you have to multiply by minus E. And then of course, we had to add in this E due to the L, and then plus a hyperbolic form, and I think it comes out to be, um, let's see, what is it, n times a hyperbolic form, or is it n over two? Uh, yes, plus n over two times the hyperbolic form is equal to this Euler characteristic. Okay, so you have a really very explicit way of calculating these things, and you can even use this to check the previous answer on the um, diagonal hypersurfaces, and the answer is yes, they agree. Okay, so I think um, I'll stop here. I wanted to uh, say a few more examples and also talk about the theory of characteristic classes for, um, for bundles in uh, bit cohomology, but I obviously don't have time for that. So thanks very much. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I particularly enjoyed all the examples, um, and I want to ask if you think there are other types of examples one should try to work out. Similarly. Oh yeah, there are lots of examples. So I mean, one example, just yeah. I mean, it's hard to tell exactly what kind of ex what kind of examples uh, you might be interested in, but just to uh, test your computational powers, um, the, there's this. Uh, I think it's called this. Uh, Line cubic in, in the surface case, we look at this equation. So 
so a nice cubic surface. And then uh, what's the Euler? You can use this, to, I mean, just something you can do sitting in front of the TV, if you have nothing better to do. Then the Euler, if this is the defining equation for X, then calculate, you get a funny five. So we know the rank has to be, um, what does it have to be? It has to be nine because that's the Euler characteristic of a cubic surface. And this five is a little surprising, but it's not so surprising because it means that this thing is actually singular mod five, but it's not singular mod three. So even in the characteristic, so the theorem doesn't work in characteristic three, but since you can specialize this, it says that this form really does calculate the um, Euler characteristic also in characteristic three. Mm -hmm. So you can write down your favorite examples. Can we compute the Euler characteristic of K3 surfaces. Well, I mean, you could do it for quartic surfaces in P3. Certainly by this method, you could um, write down any equation and uh, it's probably not so hard to find the answer for any specific equation. It just, um, I would think if you, you could, might even be able to get an answer for say the general cubic equation, but the formula would probably look rather complicated and mysterious. Too many, too many coefficients, but um, yeah. I, what about relating it to a degree six curve over which the K3 is branched? Ah, um, yeah, because then it would require a modification of this method. So this is really based on the, this clemens Griffiths theorem telling you how to compute the um, Hodge homology in terms of the Jacobian ring. And if you take a branch cover, well, it's in a, tw it's in a um, weighted projective space naturally. So you have to um, modify that, but I'm pretty sure that that should work. There should be a way um, to make that work. It's not really special for projective space. You need, the basic theorem is you need um, some bot vanishing theorem. Uh, the difference in weighted projective space is um, you have to be careful about the singularities in the weighted projective space. So uh, that's a, some technical problem, but if you stay away from the singularities, I'm sure that that would work, yes. Um, uh, following up on that, you, for your riemann Hurwitz, you have this multiplicativity of Euler characteristics that, um, uh, you know, it's great, it doesn't hold generally, but in the case of a branching over a curve, you show that um, the whole, the Euler characteristic of the whole total space is the base, the Euler characteristic of the base times the Euler characteristic of the general fiber minus these correction terms. Yes. And in general, we don't have this multiplicativity, but you could ask, um, you know, maybe in the case of uh, K3 branched over a degree six, some nice multiplicativity for the P2 and then, uh, oh, I see. Uh huh. Um, I mean, if you take, if you, well, if you take it over, if you take a cover branch over a curve, then you can try and do it by the Riemann Hurwitz formula also, just by taking a pencil in P2 and um, counting. You, you get, um, if you take a general pencil, then you'll, I mean, that might be a way to do it. You get a general pencil and you'll have the, um, the singular point will, be ordinary, will be ordinary double points, so it should be fairly explicit to calculate that. I mean, it's a finite map, it's not a pencil of curves. Um, well, I was thinking about the K3 surface. The case, yes, yeah, it's okay. a finite map to P2, uh, but it's branched on a degree six curve, right? It's a, I guess it's the two to one case, is that which K3 you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so then if you take, um, you take a general point in P2 and project to P1 from that point, then that will, if you blow up your K3 at the two points lying over the general point, then you have a morphism of the K3 to P1. And the singular fibers of that will be when your line is tangent to the degree six curve. Great. So if you take a general point, you can arrange that so it's just tangent in an ordinary, it's you know an ordinary tangent, and that will just give you an ordinary double point, a quadratic singularity on the K on the fiber over the K3. And um, 
you know, just be a single point. So they'll all be rational points, so you don't have any trace to compute. So it should be fairly uh, explicit. You need a, you, you get something in terms of this cover. I mean, I guess you can figure out how many, you know, how many double points are there? How many, how many tangencies are there for the degree six curve? You have that extension of the um, base field on the degree, from the degree six curve, you know, the, the, the uh, ramification points for that projection to uh, P1. That's some fairly large extension and presumably the, um, the, trace, the trace form for that extension then uh, suitably modified by the value of your um, local, <coughs> local indices at the double points upstairs on the surface will give you the answer. But how explicit that is, I don't know. I, I think I see what you're saying. That sounds really fun. I, I have a um, more basic question too. It have, if, could you go up to where you had the, um, the, the form on the Jacobian ring? This one? Um, no, farther up before the, yeah, right. So see how you have degree um, uh, X plus degree Y is not equal to the, the degree of, of epsilon yeah. in there? Is it a, a fact that um, the, uh, the, um, the, that in the Jacobian ring, all the terms of this degree are a multiple of epsilon? So are you saying that the way Jacobian's yeah. rings work out, it's one dimensional? That's, yeah. I mean, that it's also the degree, not the circle. The circle is in this degree, but the circle, yeah, I didn't say this. This is also equal to the Jacobian ring, yeah, thanks, of this degree. I should have said that. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, that's exactly right. The sockle is equal to that graded component, that degree component in the, in the Jacobian ring. Yeah, thanks, good point. Okay, any other questions? I don't think so. Then I wanna thank Mark again. Thanks for a wonderful talk.